Well, good morning to you. It's great to be here and to have an opportunity to speak and to share like this. And um, actually, this building holds some pretty good memories for me, so it's a joy to be here, seeing some old friends. Thank you, Jonathan, and, and making some new friends. Therefore, remember that you who at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is now made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers of the, to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Um, maybe you just want to say thanks to Alan and City to City as well. Uh, the topic before me, looking at Ephesians chapter 2 and talking really about diversity is something that is a big deal for me, and I'm sure if you live in a city like this or in a nation like this or, frankly, any part of the world, sooner or later, this is going to come knocking at your door. And if you say that you are a Christ lover and that the gospel resides in you and you're seeking to live it out, you will have to meet with this and prayerfully, one hopes that you will confront it righteously. But for me, whenever I think of this, I, I am quick to think that the fact that the, bio, the God of the Bible loves diversity. And I think every leader really needs to start there. He loves diversity from the first chapter of the first book of the Holy Bible, where we see diversity represented, where the Bible tells us how that God, having made the heavens, by the way, plural, goes on verse 11 and talks about the fact that he made the plants. And in making the plants of vegetation, he made seeds, he made plants, he made fruits of all, all kinds, all sorts. Um, I grew up in a context where, to be honest, by and large, you saw a little bit of grass, not a whole lot, and then you saw the trees in the forest. You didn't think that much in that way about it. It's certainly not me. I would come on to live in the UK like this and find out that there's a, almost a whole religion dedicated to the study of plants and botany, you get to university and so on. And then, of course, you find out that there are over 390,000 species of plants. And even those who study it are quick to say, you know, that's what we know as of now. I love statements like that because it shows off the grandeur of God and the limitations of man. He made plants, all kinds, all sorts. And if you were to ask him why he has done it, done it that way, I think he would say because he liked it. <laughs> God is not accountable to anyone because he likes it so. The diversity in plants. In Genesis chapter 1 from verse 20, you see diversity as represented with animals. How that he made, you know, the birds of the air and the beasts of the sea, of the land and, the, you know, the fish in the sea and on and on and on. Um, again, first coming to live in the UK and seeing uh, the tiniest of dogs. <laughs> The, the, just, just, the, just the tiniest of dogs, you know. Uh, where I grew up, dogs were, the dogs were, they, they were larger, bigger, and they had self-respect for themselves, you know. <laughs> and then I would come here and find, I, I didn't even know there were dogs. I, 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 what kind of animal is that? <laughs> oh, you would find out that the God of heaven made them all kinds and all sorts. On and on and on, 500,000 actually, different species of animals. And they are quick to say that we still discover something like 10,000 other species annually. I just read this yesterday. If you were to ask the God of heaven, okay, it's a little over the top, isn't it? I mean, why would you make so many in so diverse ways? He would say, I like it so. God loves diversity. It's represented from the very beginning of the book and not to be missed. It says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, and he made them male and female. Male and female created he them because he wanted his soul. God loves. He loves diversity. And that diversity, not just does he like diversity, he loves unity. 
And somehow he's made it in such a way that all of creation uh, flows together and coexists in sync somehow. That it's all unified in some kind of way because it all comes from the first cause, you see. He loves diversity, he loves unity, and they coexist together in community, rep- mimicking what exists in the Trinity. What you're really seeing is the mastery and majesty of the Trinity and the beauty that comes from it. That's how God made it. That's how God wanted it. There is no error. There is no mistake in any of this. Uh, This is a joy to tell anyone who feels they are disadvantaged by virtue of their color or anything else. But in the midst of all this beauty would come the fall. Uh, Sin would enter into the world. And with the coming of sin, everything gets damaged and destroyed. And uh, uh, human beings would learn to look at the differences that God made and created for beauty. They would learn to look at these differences and learn to use it for evil. They would learn to look at one another and say, because you're different from me, you are less than me. And survival of the fittest begins to come about. The differences that exist that were put there by God, the black skin of the African, the white skin of the Caucasian, the brown skin of the Asian, the unique and beautiful facial features of the Oriental. He put it all there on purpose to glorify him. And for man to see and enjoy the differences, but man would go on to hate it because of the nature of the fall. And when that evil works its way through, it's terrible. Uh, Six million Jews would be killed because they're different. Um, wars after wars, and you hear about it all the time. The issue is not just racism. I try to tell everyone wherever I can, there's also tribalism. Uh, The wars in places like Rwanda, between the Tutsis and the Hutus, who in a space of 100 days, over 500,000 people would be killed. They used to live together and some would coexist. But in moments of fury, as it's drummed up, hatred that was, that was hidden beneath comes to the fore. And when it vents all its anger, it's a horrible thing. Apartheid that existed for so long, and large parts of the world either closed its eyes to it or did not stand up to fight for the privileges of others because their privileges were intact. The caste system in India that still exists, where a whole people group are brought up because of philosophies of ancient philosophy, they're brought up and told, and now virtually believe it, that you were created to be less than. And millions and millions of them live that way till today. the Rohingya people, and all that has gone on with them, and the Myanmar and the refugee situation, 700,000 people displaced and being killed because they're different. And when people don't have the love of God inside them, you view differences by and large as something negative. No wonder the Bible says, Psalm 74, verse 20, it says, pay regard unto the covenant, because the dark places of this earth are full of habitations of cruelty. The Bible's way of saying, if you live in a way, place that is fallacious and all seems good and good to go, there are dark places that you don't know about, and evil exists there, and it's perpetuated by those 
who wanted to stay there and continue that way. It, it's into all this thickness of darkness, of wickedness, that the shaft, that the light of the gospel comes in. And the gospel comes in and obliterates it. It comes in the form, in the name of none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who steps down into darkness. He comes into a situation so horrific. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, just read to us. Paul describes how horrible all of that is. He talks about you who were once separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You who are strangers to the covenant, without hope and without God in the world. It does not get any worse than that. Ephesians 2.12. But it's into that, because like Philippians says, Grace always flows to the, grace like water always flows to the lowest parts. That's where, it, that's where it heads every time. It didn't come for the righteous, came for the sinner. It goes to the worst parts. It's into that that Jesus comes. And it says, in coming, it says, and Christ came, and he took those who were far off and brought them near by his blood. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. And having brought them together by his blood, he then breaks down the dividing wall of hostility. He obliterates it. That which separates people, which frankly is inside them, he, he cleans them out. And all of this happens inside him, in him, breaking down the, the wall of hostility. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. And then bringing the two together and making them into one. One new man. You might say a whole new race. You might say one new man. Ephesians 2, chapter 15, verse 15. And when he did that, bringing them together and, uh, and, and, and preaching peace, 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 the whole time. He preached peace to those who are far and preached the peace to those who are near. Ephesians 15, 16, 17. And so... This peace exists. Clearly it does in our churches, does it not? Our churches are completely mixed in every way. There are black people in our churches, not just on the streets opposite the church. There are white people in our church. They're completely mixed and they're in, they coexist in com complete joy. That it does not matter if the leader of the pastor is black. It doesn't matter if the leader of the pastor is white. They have gone beyond all of that. They coexist because this gospel we preach is powerful and we boast about it every Sunday, uh, what it can do. No wonder our churches are completely mixed. No wonder the whole world is looking around and saying the solution to racism can be found in the church because you just have to walk to a church and you see them all so diverse. No wonder people who are minorities come into our churches and find wholesomeness and love and unity. And, and the, as it were, they forget in a sense who they are because they've come to see who he is. Wouldn't you just love for that to be the story? I would. I would. You would. There's no other reason for you to be here. You haven't come to... Look at my good looks. <laughs> I see you don't believe that I have good looks. <laughs> what that means, if it's not represented in our churches, in our neighborhoods, in the world in which we live in our cities, it means that good theology is good, but it's not good enough. It means at some point, we must go beyond the expediencies of theologies and the exegesis of verses, and we have to so live it out practically that, that people get it. That no matter how small it's represented at the moment, the point is the truth is there, 
and whether it's sooner or later, the truth will show itself. And so we must go beyond loving the verses, explaining the verses, relishing in the verses, to saying, wait, wait, what am I giving up and sacrificing for me to be truly living this? I think it's with all that in mind that I come as a leader to say, you know what, I must constantly be going beyond integration to acceptance. Beyond integration to acceptance. Because integration says, you know what, uh, you know, the black people are here, the white people are there, it doesn't, it doesn't look nice. You know, we live in a better world now, let's mix this thing all together. Let's pass laws that obliterate racism. Now, I am all for those laws, because where there is no law, there is no sin, but we know there's sin everywhere. So I'm, I'm grateful to God for those laws. Oh, but the Christian needs to know that we go beyond those things to a greater depth, beyond integration to acceptance. Integration says, you know what, uh, it looks bad that, you know, everybody up front is white. Let's find a few black ones and just, just, just fix it. Put it, just put it. In. Five white, five black, whew, it's done. And would you believe it? I don't even decry that if it is done from a place of practical wisdom and wanting to demonstrate something as best we know how, even though often flawed. As long as it's gone through that depth and then coming back out, great. But if it's just cosmetic, it's going to hurt people in the end. Oh, the Christian needs to go where the gospel goes, beyond mere put them together, fit them together, beyond integration to acceptance. When Greg Dyke went into the BBC, first began to lead it ages ago, he called it hideously white. What a phrase. He called it hideously white. Because you come out, BBC used to be in London then, I believe, you know, all around. This is London. You know, I, I, I've had the privilege of traveling a little bit. I don't know many places more diverse than this place. And I believe that they're making, as best they know how, the changes. No, acceptance says, I see we're different. But those differences, should they, if we would take time and talk about it, they will complement. They will not disqualify. We must go beyond integration to acceptance because that's where the gospel goes. We must go beyond toleration to love, beyond merely tolerating to true love. That's why I'd say to any pastor, really, seeking to have these things worked out, when you preach it on day one, and everybody says, yes, 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 go home happy, then go praying. Because when the journey starts and the challenges come, you might end up finding out that, oh, people's yes doesn't quite meet up with their actions. And sadly, they would, they, would re, they would replace love for toleration. And it's not the same. Because people know when they're loved, and they know when they're just being tolerated. We must go beyond toleration to love. Toleration says, I see we're different, and I just want you to know, I won't harm you. <laughs> I won't, because I'm not that kind of guy. I don't harm people. I won't harm you. I would just ask, you know, just don't, 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 don't cross the line. I'll, I'll, I'll tolerate you. He says, I see the differences. He says, but you know what? It's just the hand that we've been dealt. I have certain privileges, you have, you got to have something going for you, you know, and you know, don't blame me for my privileges, you know, I, I, I'll pray for you, uh, uh, bye. Oh, love goes way beyond that. Love says, wait, wait. He says, I won't wait for you to do, make all the changes you can to come up. She so says, I'll come down. Why? Because 
through love, experience somebody else come down for him. And he's learned to repeat that. He has no choice when the gospel is broken and snapped inside you and the juices are flown out, are flown all over you. That's what you do. And so instead of saying you come up, he said, wait, 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 wait. How about I come down to where you are? And I, we, will, we will see the differences. And we will love the differences. And wherever there are negatives in the differences, why don't we let the spirit and the gospel change us together? And then we'll walk together. The world knows nothing of what I'm describing. The church has everything. No reason not to live this. We must go beyond integration to acceptance, beyond toleration to love, and then beyond political correctness to kingdom culture. We just have to transcend it. Because if we're going to second for political correctness, this goes to everybody, not just my white brothers, but my black brothers. You know, political correctness mandates perfection in expression. He said, you didn't do it exactly right, I'm not happy. You know, I'm just, I'm just I see my white brother when he's, he, he wants to do the right thing, and if he misses, I am, I, I am just grateful, I'm glad that he's everything in him, he wants to do the right thing. And grace, again, flows to the lowest parts. Because everybody has a role to play in obliterating, obliterating racism. The back does, the white, everybody does. The advantaged and the disadvantaged, everybody does. So we go beyond political correctness to kingdom culture. We go beyond native culture to kingdom culture. Yeah, the Jubilee Church has got, on any given Sunday, 73, something like that, different nations in it. Jubilee Church London, where I have the privilege of pastoring. And uh, that's a whole lot of cultures. That's a lot of cultures. I, I, as a pastor, I have a choice. I can go around and find out, where are you from again? Okay, tell me, what is your language there? What do I have to do? What don't I have to do? What do I... How many, how many of them am I going to memorize? How many of them am I going to remember? And even if I remember it, and I'm not going to do it, you think I'm going to say it right? It's never going to hardly come out right. And it won't be because I'm not trying. It'll be because some things... I wonder, some things, maybe I'm just not fully wired that way, but listen, that's not going to stop me from doing my best to love you, which will be evidenced by my trying. My name, everybody calls me Toppy. I like to joke to let people know, and it's not, you know, that my name is not really Toppy, it's Tokwe. Yeah. It's Tokwe. Well, let me tell you. I have concluded that the correct pronunciation of my name is just not given to the Caucasian tongue. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not. It's just not. I've had the best of friends sit me down in my living room trying to get it exactly right. And when I'm exhausted and tired, I'm like, you know what? You got it right. He didn't, he didn't. <laughs> Listen, I am not going to mandate perfection in expression. I'm bigger than that. Because the gospel, I believe, is bigger than that. Because the Lord who died for me is bigger than that. He did not die for my name to be pronounced right. <laughs> really. Therefore, I'm going to let some things go. There's some critical things to be fought for. And for my brother on the other side making all the effort, he's going to make every effort he can. Why? Because he didn't die for you to say, I don't care. And when both of us work at it that way, we find out that we end up, as it were, putting our native cultures in a particular place and grasping kingdom culture. So that the way that I approach it is this. Preach Christ in the morning, in the afternoon, and at night time. Because he alone is able to reconcile all people to himself. All people to himself. If we will go beyond integration to acceptance, and go beyond toleration to love, 
and go beyond native culture to kingdom culture, <laughs> we'll, we'll realize, you know what? We're all different, but we're no longer strangers. We're no longer foreigners, but we're fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone and the house, each of us being fit together. This is where you fit. This is how we go. But now it's done by the Spirit. And then the Spirit comes and it dwells inside what is being built, a house for the Spirit, a dwelling place for the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 17 all to 20. When we do that, there is a power that comes into play that despises description, that is subtle in its expression, but when people come around it or smell it, they know, they feel welcome, they know that they're loved, is why he said, when you do these things, by this shall all men know that you are mine, when you shall love one for another. If it is not in the church, it will not be in the city. If it is not in our homes, it will not be in the church. If it is not in the church, it will not be in the cities. If it's not in the cities, it will not be in this world. And we might, though we would never swear, be saying to the world, go to hell. But if we care, then we will say from home, in raising of my kids, this is how we live, because he loves it so. And then we will do it in the church and stay the ground and not deviate because he commands it so. And bit by bit, as we go church planting and so on, it begins to be evidenced everywhere. God bless.